Today on The Naked Garden, we're going to be exploring the world of compost extraction, where you can take a small amount of good compost and be able to stretch it throughout the entire yard. In addition, we'll be learning about the microbiology of soil, several components that are in soil and what their purposes are, as well as how you also feed them in order to be able to feed your plants. We're not interested in feeding the plants themselves, we're interested in feeding the microbiology that will take care of feeding the plants for us. And last, we'll be making apparatuses that will send applications of our compost extractions all over the place, which is equivalent to a water fight. Welcome to The Naked Garden, I'm Paul Holofko. Today we'll be talking about compost extraction. Compost extraction is different than compost tea, where compost tea is something that you extract the microorganisms in the soil, then incubate them and give them food, then you distribute them a few days later afterwards, and also in the meantime you have to aerate them, which means you give them a lot of air so they can breathe. With compost extraction, what you're doing is you're taking a small amount of compost and making it and stretching it a long way, where like you would use only maybe a little bit of compost, maybe two or three pounds of compost, and be able to use it for your whole yard instead of having a whole cubic yard of compost for your whole yard. But there's a trade-offs and also there's a little bit of a technology that's involved with this to be able to make compost stretch that far. There's a few things we need to understand first before we get into compost extraction so that can we really appreciate what compost extraction is doing for us. First, compost extraction is giving us the microbiology and putting it back into the soil so that we don't have to use synthetic fertilizers. Remember, synthetic fertilizers directly feed, say, your grass, say, your plants, from, by fixing nitrogen and then allowing it to be available for the plant to take up. What we're doing is we're going to be taking this microbiology out of the soil and then spreading more of it over your yard where the microbiology then will take over the process of being able to feed your plants. So we are feeding the microbiology which then the microbiology then feeds your plants. So you don't have to worry about how your plants are doing. All you have to worry about is how your biology is in your soil and everything really will be taken care of. Really the key part to understanding what really is in soil is understanding some of its components. Some of its components that are in soil are bacteria, which everybody's heard of. There's protozoa, fungus, nematodes, there is microorthopods, there's worms, there's, there's all sorts of things. But what we're really the most concerned about right now in this extraction are the first three. So the first one is a bacteria, really what bacteria is. Now bacteria is as a single cell organism that generally divides into two and it has its nucleus not contained with a membrane. It's kind of like sloshing around inside its little, little, little body that it has itself. A, an example of bacteria would be uh, E. coli would be, uh, you, you've seen a lot of them. It's, a lot of it is uh, pathogens, uh, which is a disease causing. Pathogens in itself does not Make, make cause a disease itself. Pathogen means that it is a disease causing. If it is, that bacteria is allowed to take over, that is when it becomes a disease, not before then. So we have pathogens and all kind of bad uh, bacteria all around us, but it's not taken over, so it doesn't really give us much trouble. A fungus is a type of animal that is, uh, has a one cell membrane, but also has this nucleus contained within a membrane as well. It can be in clumps or it can be single side by itself. An example of fungus would be athlete's foot, mushrooms, um, uh, mold on your bread. There's a variety of different funguses out there. A group of, of cells put together or with one single Hyphae, that's really the, the, the shape of the fungus itself is one little cell is the shape of a hyphae, which is like almost looks like a, like a bamboo. 
and you put several together, it's called a mycelium. A group or a whole structure of hyphae is called mycelium. A pinhead is the right the point right before a mushroom then sprouts its fruit where you actually see its mushroom. And that's just some of the stuff that you see out in the lawn or you see it out in the forest. A protist is a part of the protist kingdom, which is a single cell organism, which I'm sure you've heard before or you know about. The most famous type of protist is an amoeba. And that generally eats bacteria or it eats all sort of other type of animals. There can be parasitic ones, there can, they can eat each other, all sort of stuff. Now, for instance, there's two categories in protist. It's called a heterotrophic and autotrophic. Now, what a protist is, what a heterotrophic protist is, is a protist that eats another one. So they're cannibalistic. No problem. An example of an autotrophic protist would be kelp. For instance, it takes sunlight, and then it takes that and makes its energy out of it for it to live off. In other words, it doesn't eat it. Now, a heterotrophic, that means that's the one that eats other protists, can eat an autotrophic, which then something eats kelp. So, a lot of time, kelp put into our compost really makes our protists work. Now, why do we need to understand all this stuff, all right? They all work together in, as a food web where they eat each other in the soil. It's one giant mess of cannibalism and of absolute anarchy in the soil. And what we need to do is the more, ana more, more chaotic and the more crazy it is in there, the better our plants grow on it because one of the products of, of all this mess, all this menagerie that goes on in the soil is nitrogen, fixed nitrogen that's absorbable by the plants. Now, some of these protists are, have a mutual relationship with the plants. Some of them, the fungus have a mutual relationship with the plants, where the plants give it stuff and the fungus give it back and so forth and so on. Same goes for the bacteria. So it's really important to be able to build up our microbiology in our soil to be able to give it to our plants so that all the nutrients and energy that can be available to plants exists. So that's all we have to do and that all comes out to be free. And the way you do that is you put the microbiology back into the soil and that brings us back to our point of extracting compost. So, so when we want to get into extracting compost, we start by the bag and we start with the compost. But there's a trick to it. Remember that the bacteria and the protists and all those animals there are probably no larger than about 400 microns wide. So we need to get a type of screen that we can put the compost in and then filter those particular animals out into the water so that we can then spray it all over the yard. And the way you do that is you get one of these bags. Now these, this bag costs roughly about $45. You can get them cheaper sometimes depending on where it is. It's made out of like a nylon and the weave on here, if you take a look real close, is 400 microns wide. So we're making the assumption that these animals are no larger than 400 microns and they will go and they will go through here. So you put compost in here, put it into the bag, and then you put it into water. All right. So the first thing we have is a bag of compost. I filled this bag of compost roughly about, oh, about maybe a third, a quarter full, maybe about two pounds. And this will get me roughly about uh, maybe 15 gallons of extracted compost tea. No, I'm sorry. That's not tea, it's compo extracted compost, no tea. And what's in here is compost that I made over the last uh, 21 days, maybe uh, 30 days. And this has the right amount of protists, nematodes, uh, uh, bacteria and fungus that I want in here. And the way I did that is by using a microscope. Now, I'll show you real quick here how to be able to examine this, but one trick here is to understand that you need to have first good compost before you can actually make good extracted compost. That means is you have to really take an effort to make your compost just right. Now, if you want more references on that, take a look at other episodes of this show, and then I'll show you how to make more of a fungal type of compost or more a bacteria one. I made this particular type of compost more fungal because here in Northern California, all and behold, how much fungus do we have in the soil? Nothing. We have mostly bacteria because it's disturbed and we have very, very little protists. So I'm going to make a com compost extraction that will be more favored toward protist 
and toward fungus and minimize the amount of bacteria. If you're on the east coast, all right, that is a lot more water out there. And so fungus grows like crazy. You even have fungus on your grass. We growing on top of the grass. It means your fungal structure underneath the grass is very high and you need more bacteria because it's being compromised. So you have to grow a type of compost that's more bacterial. Take a look at other shows and I'll show you how to make a bacteria version of compost. So when we're ready to start extracting compost tea, we need to have the actual equipment that won't destroy the microorganisms that we diligently try to create in our compost. And the only way really to do that is to test, test, and test. That means you test the stuff that's going into your compost extractor, you test it when it comes out of your nozzle. In this case, what I have here is a compost tea extractor with a pump. And the pump is down underneath here, and the, the, the tea bag, this tea bag goes in here, we wet it down, and then we pump it out, and then we spray it. Here's a hose, this is all rubber hose, and we spray it out onto the yard. That's basically how it works. However, we must really first examine to make sure that our equipment is not destroying our, our creation of, of uh, animals. So if you take a look at the architecture here, what I did was is I put a bucket on top of a frame. So what I have here, here's all taken apart. So what I have here, here's a bucket that has an exit hose and a and a, a drill hole goes into a large pipe hose that goes into a diaphragm pump. Diaphragm pump then pumps the liquid into the, into the hose and then sprays out. Now, there's a 12-volt uh, battery that I have attached to it, so the whole business here runs on 12 volts. So you have 12 volts coming into here, going first to the pressure sensor. This is a diaphragm pump, which is actually quite different than a regular centrifugal pump, like say for a hot tub or for a um, uh, a whirlpool or for a sewage uh, treatment plant where they use centrifugal pumps. This is a diaphragm pump which is a, called a positive displacement pump. A centrifugal pump is called a non-displacement, uh, positive displacement pump. The difference is, is this actually for every single turn or crank of the, of, of the shaft of the motor there's actually a certain amount of volume of liquid that goes through and it's calculatable. In other words, one turn will give you X number amount of, of liquid. If you have a non-positive displacement pump, it basically, it turns it and mills it all up inside there and until it actually pushes whatever amount that it can actually get out. Another example of a positive displacement pump would be a gear pump, vein pump. There, there are endless, endless amounts of pumps that are available out there, but each one needs to be tested. Now, I chose this particular one, this high flow cold gold series pump, for two reasons. One, it's available, and second, it's cheap. This cost me $65, and what I did was I went to Tractor Supply, which is down in Gilroy, and got this and put it. This is where they use for uh, uh, tanks for pesticides, where they want to uh, spray pesticides everywhere, and it's a relatively inexpensive way to go. Other pumps are a lot more expensive, plus they won't be able to handle water. They Normally, a lot of times, if you use hydraulic pumps that are made out of metal, so it'll start rusting inside. The trick behind this one is it has a, has a sensor over here where it always will produce 35 PSI on the output of the, of the hose. So in other words, water comes in here at the pressure of one atmosphere and then goes pumps and then it's stopped in here and it keeps at 35 PSI. This thing will stop pumping when it finally hits 35 PSI. So it saves the battery and it also saves wear and tear on the motor. So what you need to do, the first thing you need to do is test to see if your entire equipment isn't destroying all the microorganisms that you're working for. So the way you do that is actually quite simple. You take your entire pump and your apparatus over here, all right? Let's put some water in here and we're only gonna put one gallon of compost tea. And what we'll do is we'll run it for 20 minutes. So this particular pump is is designed to run one gallon per minute. So by running it 20 minutes and putting the exit hose right back into the, into the pumping hose, into the pumping bucket, that means all the water will have gone through here 20 times.
Okay. So we have one gallon of water in here. And what we need to do is we also need to test our valve here as well. Because a lot of times microorganisms, microorganisms will be destroyed by the, uh, by the actual mechanics of how it goes in through the valve. So let's put it on here. Let's turn our pump on. Where is my uh, switch here? All right, and you can actually see all the water going through here. So 20 minutes later, you're ready for a test. Now, do you remember how I told you you need to test your compost tea before you actually spray it out there? Well, here is the test of it before we actually did this test. And here's one afterwards. Now, you take a look at it and you can see there's actually roughly about a difference about 25%. That means if you take a look at those small little dots, you see there's in the frame on the left over here, you'll see there's small little dots and it says they're kind of jumping around. Well, those are actually bacteria. Those are one micron with bacteria. They're jumping around. Take a look on the right, you only see about 25% of those. Take a look at the long strands or any other type of um, uh, microorganisms in there and you'll find out a lot of it has been destroyed on the right. Take a count of how many organisms are still running around loose or actually even available to be, uh, to be recognized. And I estimated in this particular case, it's roughly about 25%. So, now since we are trying to figure out what is the percentage of bacteria and fungus and protozoa that's being destroyed by going through this mechanism, we know we went through it 20 times. So each time, we're assuming it's gonna be like, um, um, a percentage that goes through, like say 93%. In this case, I happen to know it's 25%. So that means is if you took 93% 93, 93 times 93 times 93, 20 times, because remember it went 20 times through the entire business here, you'll end up with 25. Well, the way you go that backwards is you take 25 and take the 20th root of it, which is really, if you take a look here, it equals the 20th root of 25, or 0.025 the 20th root, and then you, then you calculate it out, and you'll find out it's roughly about 93, uh, 25, whatever the number comes out, at roughly about 93%. So each time your compost extraction goes through the, the whole business over here, only 7% of it is being destroyed by the mechanics of the pump itself. Next thing we need to do is fill the bucket up halfway with water. And once that's done, we'll take our tea bag with our 400 micron spacing, which is right here, and then put it in here. The best way to do this, you can see the stuff's coming out already. The best way to do this is to agitate it yourself. So what you're doing is you're mushing it around and you're just Cleaning it up it is a kind of a mess. And you can see, I should see what the color is coming out. What happens is if your compost is, has gone anaerobic, which anaerobic means that it has, anaerobic means it has gone uh, less than six particles of oxygen per million. Uh, it actually starts turning into almost like a coal which then makes the compost look black. You don't want your compost to look black. You want it to look like really chocolate brown. And you look at the color of this, you'll see it really isn't black, but it's actually brown. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this same compost, the same compost tea, probably for another two or three more gallons of the stuff to make my extract to go over the whole yard. My whole yard would roughly take about 10 gallons, so I'll probably make one more out of this, okay? Once you're done, fill the rest up with water until you get to roughly to the so much so that you, can't, you don't really spill anything over anymore. When you uh, fill it all the way up until you really know you're comfortable being able to carry it where you don't spill anymore. 
All right, now, a couple things about this. You can actually see there's some, some white stuff on the top. It's actually a very good compost extract, and it doesn't look very, very black. Now what we need to do is we need to feed it. In other words, is if we took this extraction and then just fling it out on the yard, in this case, I'm going to do my lawn and part of my, uh, my flower beds, it's going to probably not survive. We need, because the microbiology that's already there, the, the population of the microbiology that's already there probably can't sustain it because it hasn't had that load on it. So what we do is we actually take food and we put it in here. So what we do is we actually have different types of food. So we have food for bacteria, we have food for protists, and we have food for uh, fungus. So let's go over the different types of food. Here we start with the different type of foods available for us to be able to use in a compost extraction that will be actually quite usable for anybody who wants to use extraction and can be usable with this equipment. And what I did is I grouped them in by the different type of foods for the different type of microorganisms that are in the soil. This one will be for bacteria, that will be for fungus, and that will be for the protists over there. And we'll go over each one. This right here is called fish bone meal. And um, what, what you have to do here with this is not put it into the compost extraction, but probably put it for a couple days, maybe a cup or so, in your compost pile so that the bacteria can grow a lot stronger or, or a lot stronger in numbers over the next couple of days before you use your compost extraction. A lot of this stuff is, what this is, is really it's fish bone that's been ground up in a grinder. So a lot of the oil has been taken out of it and a lot, it'll be a really good material for, say, uh, for bacteria. Bacteria eat it like crazy. If you wanted to make a food for nematodes, and I know we didn't go over nematodes, but we'll go over it in another session, this will be a good food to feed the bacteria then that will eat the nematodes. So you have another couple of layers if you want to start propagating nematodes. But that's another story as it is. Another good material to use for propagating bacteria, especially if you're on the East Coast and you want to get more bacteria inside of your, uh, your soil, is uh, molasses. Molasses is also good for fungus as well, but molasses is a sugar that the bacteria eat up like in no time. So it's something wonderful you can use. All you need to do in a bucket like this is put maybe two or three tablespoons. Don't put a jar, don't put a gallon. Put on two or three tablespoons. Remember, all this stuff is in solution, so it's not going to be very, very concentrated. And, and when you're looking at a microscope slide, it will not be very, very, uh, uh, very dense. So don't put a lot of stuff in there, only a couple of tablespoons. Like this stuff right here, we'll only put in uh, roughly about maybe a, one cup of all of it together in that one five gallon bucket. So you don't really put that much into it. All right, that takes care of the bacteria. The uh, fungus is right here. Now there are two forms of stuff and fungus you can do here. One is if you want to use, you have to use a high carbon or a, or a high type of almost like straw. High carbon would be like oatmeal. Take oatmeal, this is grain like corn, wheat, barley, things like that. Uh, that you put into a compost pile and allow it to grow the fungus. Make sure you don't disturb your fungus, disturb your compost pile because it'll break up the fungus strands. So that's one thing. But what we're doing here is we're using fungal, we're using uh, fish hydrogenate, and this is different than uh, fish emulsion. Fish hydrogenate is one that takes the fish, the entire fish, puts it in a blender with water and blends it all up and keeps the oils in it. This stuff smells really, really bad. And so you put this with it and you put that with your five gallons a bucket for extraction and it goes through the pump in no time. Thing is, fish, hydro, um, fish emulsion is good for making bacteria. It's like the fish bone meal. It doesn't have the oils that the fungus needs in order to be able to grow. So it's another good food for for bacteria. Uh, fish hydrogenate, which is the entire fish with the oil, is fantastic for fungus. It grows in no time. Last but not least is kelp. Now this is autotrophic and what this thing does, this stuff is basically kelp 
that is out in the ocean. They grind it up very fine and then it's in liquid form. And it's smaller than 4, 400 microns. So it actually very easily goes through the pump with no damage. And this is the exact perfect food for, uh, for protists. And it's, it's actually excellent, quite excellent. And it has a side benefit of it smelling like the ocean, especially after you spray all this stuff uh, on, on your grass, it'll smell like fish hydrogenate, which smells terrible. And then, then it will smell like also like the ocean because you're using the kelp. And that's generally that smell is what you have when you go to the ocean and you smell uh, the fresh air it is actually some of the kelp rottening. So sorry to break any type of fantasies anybody has had. All right, that takes care of the food. So we're gonna take a half a cup of this, half a cup of this for every five gallons and, and we start spreading. So let's go ahead and do that. You can use any, here we start out with a trusty measuring cup. You can use any measuring cup that you happen to have around the house. Just put it in the dishwasher afterwards. Same thing also goes for cleaning your, your bag. You can easily clean your bag by putting it into the washing machine. Just try to hose it down before or else it collects too much stuff in the, in, the, in the machine. So let's put in, this is our compost extraction. Let's put in, uh, you know what? I almost forgot. You gotta shake this before. You gotta get, oh God, it stinks. All right, shake this pretty good before you put it in. So we got a half a gallon, half a, half a cup of this stuff. Okay. And then half a cup of kelp. Now all these particular materials you can pick up at a hydroponic store. And it generally costs, uh, this one's cost me $20. This is the Vital Fish Hydrogisate, which is very low on the, uh, it's like 0.5 on the nitrogen. It's like, it's very small. You don't care. You're interested in feeding your fungus and then anything else. And the uh, kelp cost me another $20, also at a hydroponic store. So just sit here and rinse this out. So just rinse your cup out. Okay. And then take your bucket and you're off to spraying your yard. So carry it around, you got a 10 foot hose and you're done.